Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our Saturday Dhamma. I was recently uh, I was approached by someone in in the nearby area I was eating lunch and someone came up to uh, and uh, and talked to me a, a man from Nepal he asked me if I was a Buddhist monk and he asked if I practice vipassana or I think it, it I was saying I he asked why I became a Buddhist monk and I said because I went to practice meditation and he said what like like vipassana and I said yes but kind of hesitantly because I'm never quite sure what to answer about what we practice we call it vipassana, but we don't really practice vipassana. What we practice is mindfulness or sati, satipatthana. And, well, satipatthana is something very important to talk about. I thought tonight I would talk a little bit about vipassana because it comes up and people ask about it and talk about it and we do claim that our practice is called vipassana meditation. The reason why we make that claim and can make that claim is because the meaning behind it is that Our purpose is vipassana, our goal. Like if someone asks you or asks me what I'm studying in university, I can say I'm doing doing my undergraduate degree. But the degree itself only comes at the end. The degree is what I'm aiming for. It's kind of like that. But we call it vipassana meditation. It's become a bit of a buzzword in the right circles. And so the question is, what does this word mean? What do we mean by vipassana? What, what, what's the reason for using this word to describe what we do? What is this goal that we're aiming for? Isn't the goal freedom from suffering, enlightenment, peace? What's this idea of a new goal or an intermediary goal? So the word vipassana means insight. It's a fairly literal translation. Passana means sight or seeing. And we... V means special or uh, penetrative, like getting into or through. Means clear. So seeing clearly, seeing into, maybe clear seeing is the best. Vipassana means to see out, to see. To see out of the clouds, out of the mist, out of the darkness. Or it means to see in through the the cover of the 
the fog, the illusion, to see through the illusion of, of life. So it refers to a kind of a realization or an insight, wisdom, knowledge. And so you see, hopefully, why this isn't something you can practice. I think not understanding that we're not actually practicing vipassana leads to a lot of problems for meditators who cultivate the, this idea that distinct from, say, samatha meditation, where you're just trying to calm the mind, that in vipassana meditation somehow you should be actively seeking insight, reflecting, considering, thinking, ruminating and so on, which certainly isn't the case. In fact, vipassana meditation in practice is a lot like samatha meditation. There really shouldn't be that much difference in the feeling or the the uh, exercise, the, the mechanics of it. The difference and the reason why vipassana is different from samatha is because the object is different. The same um, intensity of practice should be applied. You're still trying to focus. You're still trying to grasp an object. You're still trying to uh, become absorbed in a sense, to be focused, unshaking, to have a strong um, state of mind. But the object is different, and that's important because the things that we're trying to see, the, the realizations that constitute a revealing of reality, the casting off of the delusion and the darkness of our murky, unmindful states of mind. These realizations can only be found in a certain type of object. There are certain objects that you can take in meditation that really won't allow you to see clearly. In in the particular way that we are trying to see clearly because vipassana doesn't just mean to see something clearly if that were the case the meditation on say a light or a a flame people will meditate on a candle flame meditating on om for example a sound these could allow you to, they do allow you to see clearly. Eventually you will see that object so clearly. But the problem with those objects is they're missing, they're missing some important quality. I mean, the, really the important quality that they're missing is reality. When you focus on a candle flame, if you focus enough, you're not actually focused on the candle flame. Eventually you, you're able to focus on the concept of fire. And because it's a concept, it's in very important ways unlike reality. So I talked recently about evil and how that's the only thing standing between us and happiness. Really, I mean, world, what's wrong with it? Why is there? Why aren't we always happy in this wonderful, beautiful world? But there's something missing from that equation, because it's not quite convincing. I think. Yes, maybe anger clearly, and and that kind of thing is evil. But the argument for why craving is evil, it's hard to hard to understand, hard to appreciate. If you just say addiction or wanting things, 
wanting things, that why is that evil? What's wrong with craving? What's wrong? Why did Buddha say this is the cause of suffering? Hard to see. But the reason why craving is problematic is not a good thing, ultimately. It's because of the qualities of reality. Once you see reality, it's almost like magic. Your, your, your perception of craving and desire changes. When you look at reality and actually see it for what it is, there's for some reason, and we'll explain why, the desire you held for reality is, it vanishes. It's almost as though you had something in your hand and you thought it was just some wonderful thing and then you open your hand and it turns out you thought it was maybe a, a gumdrop or something And you open your hand and it's a small turd And as soon as you realize it's not what you thought it was Do you still do you still want it? Do you still like it? Someone puts something in your hand and says it's chocolate And you say, ooh, chocolate Feels like chocolate, I like chocolate And you open your hand and Oh, it's poop Do you still do you still feel do you still want it? No, there's no question. It's not like the one thing you're doubting now. You know, I liked it when I thought it was chocolate. Should I still like it now? There's not nothing like that. That it would be ridiculous to suggest that you might still desire it, think in a way that you desire chocolate, unless you're one of those strange people in the texts that karmically somehow has this result that they. Like eating poop There was a guy who had bad, very bad karma It's apparently a, in, real, in, in modern times as well They have cases of people who are attracted to eating feces It's considered to be a result of bad karma But why is it? Why is it when you look at reality? Certainly when you stare at a candle flame You don't realize that you can stare at it and see that it becomes so engrossed in this fi in fire or a light or om, for example. Why is it you can focus on om for days, weeks, months, years and never get, never lose your interest in it? This these concepts, this the object, it becomes. It's not the sound anymore. It's the concept of om, or it's the Concepts, the the light concept, concept means it's something that you 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 conceive of in your mind. Like if I close my eyes and I think of the Buddha, yep, still the Buddha. I can focus on the Buddha as long as I want, and if I become very very focused on the Buddha, I will never get tired of that concept. Why doesn't that work for reality? Why can't I focus on? The buzzing of the fly in this room We need a net because Not not because it's a, annoying But because a Poor fly Doesn't want to be in here I need to get the fly out Why can't that fly be a Why can't that fly lead to States of absorption And, and peace and happiness If ever there's a long time ago there was this someone put a video up of a guy trying to meditate around a fly and getting very, very, very angry. If you've ever tried when flies land on you, it can be quite aggravating actually. But uh you know, I think even just the fly buzzing, if you're not if you're trying to if you're trying to be peaceful, if you're if you're attached in a in a sort of a samatha meditation kind of way. To peace and, and, and calm A fly buzzing could be quite disturbing Quite unpleasant And this is what 
what we are trying to understand in vipassana. This is what we come to see through through watching reality. You don't even have to talk about it. The best reason for talking about vipassana and what vipassana means, I haven't. I will. I am going to tell you. I just. This is only the introduction right now. The real best reason for talking about it is because of how discouraging it can be. When a meditator begins to see clearly, when they when they actually commit to observing reality, it feels very much like something's wrong. Until they can learn to appreciate what they're seeing, the meditators will be quite dissatisfied by what they experience. And I've talked about this before. Meditators will come and say, you know, I'm trying to meditate, but it's just not working. What do you mean? What's the problem? Oh, it's changing all the time, chaotic, unpredictable. And they won't say it exactly like that, but it's easy to recognize what they're saying. I can't control my mind. It's it's unpleasant. They'll tell me all about how unpleasant it is and how uncontrollable their mind is, how they can't control their mind to stay with the rising and falling. They can't control their body. How unpleasant it is. How the happy feelings don't last. It's unpredictable, chaotic. And I think something's wrong. It sounds like something's wrong, right? What's wrong with your meditation? What's wrong with you? Trying to sit still, trying to be at peace. Look at all those monks who just sit there and... Still like a forest pool. Why aren't we like that? Why am I not like that? Vipassana means to see three things. Many of you are familiar with these three things. If not, you should be. Again, this is what we're trying to practice. It means to see that inside of ourselves and in the world around us, every real thing, not something we conjure up in our minds, like the Buddha, yep, still the Buddha. No. Nope. The things that are real are impermanent, unpredictable, unstable, changing. Viparinama dhamma, of a nature to change. We don't even realize it, but our much of our our effort, our ambition in life is to gain stability. Stability, worthwhile goal. Right? How we try to get a good job, how we try to get in a stable relationship with someone. How we try to become reassured of good things. You don't want to live unsure. So we build up all these concepts of things. We find things that last long. Like a good job, a stable family situation or society. And we build up these ideas of stability and permanence. It's doable, you know, you can live many years that way. But it's really dumb. It's really, really unwise. It's unwise because it because of how short-sighted it is 
our view of the world, the world of reality is terribly short-sighted. Well, it's meaningless. You, you live some few years in, in, in a stable situation. Reality is unpredictable. You, you, you commit to this idea of stability And your neighbors, what's happening with them? Look around your neighborhood You'll find someone who's lost everything Been devastated, got in a car accident Lost their legs, lost a limb Got cancer Yeah, cancer, right? Can, can your job protect you from cancer? Can your family protect you from cancer? So many things it's not happening to me. How foolish, right? It will. Something will happen. Again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Has happened again and again and again and again. We cut out this little piece of time and say, look, look at how stable everything is. Look at how the universe goes according, goes you know, smooth. And we're good at forgetting as well. We're good at forgetting all the chaos. It's amazing how some people can just forget and say, yeah, life is good, when you've seen them crying and wailing and moaning and utterly depressed before. If you look at dogs, dogs are like this, or cats, totally massacring each other and then wagging their tails the next moment. Humans are not much better. A big part of the problem, I think, is that our lives are... Well, I don't know what's the, what's the problem. Is it because our lives are too short or our lives are too long? If our lives are too long, we lose sight of, of, of impermanence. Right? There, there's beings who live millions or billions of years. Human life is relatively short. It's funny because that shortness of life, the the specter of death often prevents us from seeing impermanence. It, it forces us to focus on meaningless things, on grasping at some sort of stability while we can. It's funny, right? You'd think with death approaching we'd be a little more philosophical. Some are, many are. Hopefully people listening to this generally are. Try to be more philosophical and think, oh yeah, death is, death changes everything. But not just death, sickness, loss, change. But this is all, it's, it's, it's a little bit depressing to talk about life in that way. And meditation isn't depressing at all because it's, we're not dealing with concepts. We're, we're on a, dealing on a whole other level. We're actually effecting some kind of deeper transformation. The deep transformation is this realization, vipassana. It's not a, like something you can really even put in, should put into words. You could try, I could sit here and intellectualize it and give you an idea of it. But the realization of impermanence is this change of mind. It's not a thought that comes up, it's a change of perspective. Instead of seeing things as stable and, and in terms of how can I make them more stable, it's about seeing the impermanence, seeing the chaos, and in some sense becoming comfortable with it. Not exactly comfortable with it, but comfortable in the face of it. It's not like impermanence is ever going to be a great thing, a good thing. Yes, sometimes change is good, but incessant change, constant change, unpredictable change. It's a different way of looking at reality. When you see it, when you see it, wow. When you see it, what happiness, what peace. 
It's not depressing at all. Because your perspective changes. Reality stays the same. You know, reality that's impermanent. When you are seeking permanence, that's suffering because they clash. But when reality is impermanent and you understand, you look at reality as if it's impermanent, there's no surprises. You're not shocked when things change. Why did they change? Why did I lose that thing that was impermanent? That's the first one. The second one is suffering. Dukkha. And we always have to qualify this. Because, hey, wait a minute. There's a lot of sukha, right? There's a lot of happiness in the world. All this pleasure. So it's complicated. We have to talk about the difference between pleasure and happiness. But let's make it really simple. Well, let's step back a bit before we get into the details of how a vipassana meditator sees suffering. What is suffering and happiness in the world? Let's look at people. Who is really happy in the world? Business people, are they happy? Politicians? Sometimes we're so upset about rich people and, polit and powerful people. But upset in a way that it's unfair that they should be so happy. We don't say it like that, but we do think that they've got all these things that we want. I think, you know, if we're a bit high-minded, we're we're a little bit less keen on it. But it's quite it's quite hard not to be jealous of presidents or queens, kings, movie stars. Wow, that's the life, right? People like uh, Kurt Cobain. Uh, <laughs> it's the best example. No, it's a bad example, I suppose. But he was very rich, right? Very famous. Britney Spears is, I think, a good example. If you know anything about her history, the hard times she's gone through. I remember before I was Buddhist, I... I think it was the, whatever those, what are the music awards? Some music award thing. What's the big music award? Is that the Grammys? Anyway, some big music award. And I, they had a pre-interview. And you could, it was, it was remarkable. How, how she was really not happy. She looked great. She looked ready to get up on stage but she said I think I'm done I think I want to take a break now I don't know what the details of her life were but who's really happy rich people what about uh, famous activist people I was thinking earlier about who who would be happy what about Gandhi with all his political activities, I don't think so. I think some happiness at getting a free India, but I don't think Gandhi was much like he was in the movie. From what I hear. What about, I was thinking Martin Luther King. I bet Martin Luther King had some happy times. Because I think he did some good for people. And I think that's a key, right? makes us happy is good things, doing good things makes us happy. But I think it's hard to find, it's hard to even conceive of someone happier than an enlightened being. No, I don't I don't think you can even with an imperfect understanding of reality really feel that these people are happy. Why not? Why aren't we happy with all these good things getting what we want, right? We 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 uh, we're jealous of them. But when you look at them, do they seem happy to you? I think generally no. Generally they shouldn't seem happy. 
If they seem happy, I think there's something wrong with your perception. You're yeah, sure happy sometimes. Pleasure, great pleasure. And we're jealous of their pleasure. But there's there's stress involved. Why? Why is it? Why is it dukkha? You know, sukha is even dukkha. All all the pleasure that we get in the world is still dukkha. This is what we mean by unsatisfying. It's not the way to find happiness. For so many reasons. Well, for a couple I can think of anyway. Impermanence is a big one. Because impermanence doesn't just mean it doesn't last forever. It means it's unpredictable. Well, it means both of those. It means unpredictable and also... Oh, it takes work to get it. And guess what happens if you stop working for it? It doesn't just poof, stay forever, right? It's impermanent. But it's worse than that. It's not just impermanent. It's habit-forming. It's addictive. And so not only do you risk loss, but you risk an increasing, an increased level of dis of discomfort dissatisfaction when it goes a person who's never known a person who's never had an iphone <laughs> is going to be far less upset potentially i mean some people are pretty awful about craving I iphones i think or were these stories about kids in China selling organs for them or something. <laughs> so someone who's never heard of an iPhone, let's go there. Because it's not about the thing, right? It's about the experience. If you see advertisements with famous people holding iPhones... It's very easy to crave something you've never had. Mahasi Sayada talked about this. He thought it was interesting... There was this young man who didn't want a wife, wasn't keen to have a wife. It's actually a common story in in uh, in, in, this, in the texts. They reuse this story a couple of times. Didn't want a wife. No interest. He had been he had been re reborn from the Brahma realms, and in the Brahma realms, there's no sexual intercourse or romance. So, just didn't have interest. His parents tried to get him interested, said, look, we'll find you a wife. You need to marry, you need to pass on, pass on whatever you pass on. And he got so fed up, he said, look, and he was rich, his family was rich. So he called the goldsmiths in and he asked for some gold and he started carving a golden statue. Carving, I don't know how it works. May, casting, maybe you cast a golden statue. I don't carve gold, I guess. Uh, created a statue that was so beautiful. It was a woman who was just the perfect shape and perfect features, everything. And he said, if you can find me a woman who looks like this, I will get married. Parents very well called their slaves or servants or people and said, take this statue on a cart around the country. If you find a girl that looks like that, bring, invite her, let's get her married, get them married. Brought, brought her around and sure enough, eventually they found such a, a, a girl. They found this girl and suddenly this guy starts to get obsessed because he's thinking about the, the, the beauty and he just, can't, he just can't imagine and suddenly this craving arises in him. He'd never even seen the girl, Mahasi Saya does it. He's never even seen the girl and yet he has such, this craving arise. You can't, that's not possible for his craving to arise based on something you've never experienced. So what's going on here? It's, so the girl isn't real, right? The, a girl or me or you or a person, it's just a concept. 
but he certainly has experiences and he has this ability to experience. We even have ability to fantasize, to imagine people we've never met, experiences we've never encountered. But, we, but that's an experience. That experience in our minds is able very well to, to take the place of an actual external experience in terms of triggering desire. And it can become so it became so obsessive with this young boy. I don't remember how the story ends, but not well. You know these stories about people who become rich and how it spoils them. Why are rich people not great? Isn't it good karma? Isn't it because of good karma? Aren't they people who have lots of good karma? Yes, but good karma brings you happiness. Happiness quite often brings you bad karma. Why? Because it's addictive. Happiness is addictive. Once you get happiness, nobody really thinks about doing good deeds. That's not true, but it becomes harder. This is why heaven is, some people say, don't go to heaven. Too happy. Now I don't subscribe to that. I always tell people go to heaven because there's lots and lots of Buddhists in heaven. And I hope they don't disappoint me or us by when we say that they're probably all listening, studying the Dhamma and practicing the Dhamma and they're sitting still in meditation for months on end. That's where you want to go. But without the Buddha's teaching, Heaven is very dangerous. It leads to great corruption. I mean, study addiction. It's 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 undeniable. We just don't make that leap from taking heroin, being addictive, to watching pornography, being addictive. It's all it's the same chemicals in the brain, right? There's still one, I guess heroin adds chemicals to the brain, but we've got lots of chemicals up there already. We're pretty good at producing our own drugs. Well, we're not great at it, which is really the problem. Is you, you, you constantly need more and more, and and have a harder time to cultivating. It. And so, the same with heroin. The heroin, uh, it, it, the receptors for the heroin, whatever. I can't remember what the chemical actually is. But the receptors are strained and require more, more heroin each time, or more of any drug each time. Point being, unsatisfying is not just about it not lasting, it's about the addictive nature of it and how it's ruthlessly, viciously unpleasant when you build up craving for something and then lose it or don't get it. When your iPhone screen cracks, when you get in a car crash and your beautiful vehicle is suddenly scratched or beat or crashed or so on. When you lose your legs, when you lose your health, when you lose your wife, your husband, how much we love our family when you lose a child. I mean, we wax poetic, I think, about it, not to sound overly cruel, but what did you expect? <laughs> That's pretty cruel, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> what I mean to say is that we have this this romantic idea of family so deeply ingrained and that even to say that is blasphemous in many cultures. Family is important. Family is sacred. Sacred. What's well, rubbish? Family is impermanent. That's the truth. Family is who knows why we were born. We have all these theories. God wants us to be together, etc., etc. Rubbish. Truth is, nobody really knows why we're born together. No, most people don't know. What I mean to say is, society in general has lots of speculation and eventually settles on a not knowing kind of physicalist view that, oh, it's just. Random 
or not random, but whatever. It's there's no meaning behind it. But important point: family is impermanent. Your all of your family members could die at any time, and that's unfortunate because they make you happy. If they make you happy, it's unfortunate if they make you happy. But it's even worse than that. It's devastating. Not because they make you happy, but because you've come to depend on that happiness. How wonderful it is to see all of our family members. Not only do we feel that, we rejoice in it and we believe it to our depths of ourself, how important it is. Well, guess what? You're all going to die. We're all going to die. I mean, it's not even it's not even pessimistic to say that. It's like this happens every hundred years or so. <laughs> it's been happening and happening and happening. Aren't you tired of it yet? It's like Groundhog Day, except it lasts 70, 80, 90 years if we're lucky. And then we do it all over again. Fortunately, we forget. Suffering, so this is suffering, dukkha, I mean this is sort of the depressing side of it How all this crap that we cling to is not going to satisfy us But suffering is actually liberating and, and such a happy thing to see When you see it phenomenologically, again it's the same with impermanence Same as with impermanence, seeing it as a meditator is a source of great joy, great peace All oh, those things I was clinging to are not satisfying it's not a th thought. Again, it's a real. It's a shift of perception. Think of someone who is miserly and clinging to things, suddenly realizing, "Oh yes, I shouldn't cling." How happy they will suddenly be! Suffering is a great happiness. Realization of suffering, vipassana, dukkha jnana. It's great happiness. Stop trying to find happiness. It's like you, st maybe if I hit my head against the wall, I'll be happy, right? This will make me happy. Oh, what a foolish thing. And then when you realize, oh, wait, that's dukkha. Great, good for you. Stop hitting your head against the wall. Dukkha. That's the second one. The third one is anatta. And this one, this one people have a hard time with. Again, we are inundated with views and beliefs, reinforcement of self, ego, possession, control, control yourself. Mine. Me, mine, the Buddha. The words we use are ahankara, mamankara. It's a very, very beautiful way of putting it. When I first heard this, I thought that's so apt. Because ahang means I, mamang means my, and kara means uh, making. It's from karma, kara. It's kar, the root kar, which means to do, to make. I making and my making. Ahankara, mamankara. In Thai, they say ahankan mamankan. It's just a corruption of the Pali. What do we mean? Not me, not mine, not I. Well, let's step back again. We'll look at the facts. Is our body ours? Did I get to choose this ugly face? Did I choose to go bald? Make shaving easier. What about my smell? Did I choose to smell like this? Did I choose to sweat like this? Did I choose for my beard to grow? No, the body's not self. But wait a minute, the mind, I can... I can decide to go on a diet or so on I can decide to be healthy
I mean, that being the case, there's a lot of unhealthy people who who wish they could be healthy. You know, fat people who want to be thin. Um, people who are addicted to junk food, who want to go on a diet, for example. There are people who are depressed and angry and anxious and afraid, sad, confused. And can't stop, can't turn it off. In fact, hey, wait a minute. Yes, I yes, the mind is a force that affects the body. But wait a minute, there's something wrong here. There are certainly aspects of me that I would much rather do without, but I can't change them. I wish I wasn't angry. Certainly wish I wasn't greedy. Oh. Meaning addicted to this or that. My fear, I wish I could do away with that. What about the depression? Oh, if only I wasn't so depressed. You can't do it. Why can't you just turn it off? Sure, you can decide today I'm not going to eat that cheesecake. You can't turn off the cravings. You can't turn off the anger. I will try to put up with this person. You do it for some time. No, there's something wrong here. It's not there's there's some aspect of us that is not self. It's not under our control. In fact, there appears to be some kind of a correlation. The more you try to control things, the more of a control freak you are. Trying to control even your own mind. Keep it all in order. The more stressed and upset you become. The harder it becomes. It becomes a, a, a chore. Just living can become a chore. Just trying to force yourself to, to be this way, to not be that way, and so on. The Buddha broke it down for us. He said, let's look at it in pieces. What about feelings? Can you control your feelings? Happy, unhappy? Can you say, poof, let me be happy? Because if you could, well, you'd never be unhappy, right? I'm going to be happy all the time. Can you just say that? What about perceptions? Can you say, I'm not going to remember this, I'm not going to remember that, I'm only going to remember the good times. You can train yourself in all these things, of course. I mean, there's cause and effect relationships that can be cultivated, but it's not the same as just saying, no, don't think that. You know, it's usually, I don't think that, and then you think of it immediately. Again, with the trying to control there appears to be this relationship, and I'm only talking in terms of general understanding, we're not yet as a meditator. There's something wrong with this idea that we're in charge or in control. Because we have this vague idea that we are, this vague idea that, yeah, I can, I can fix that, I can fix this. But the more we try, when we actually apply ourselves to control, it makes things worse. Why are we suddenly more stressed? We think, if only I'm positive, I'll just think positive. Try it. Try forcing yourself to feel positive. Yeah, it's it's okay. It's um, you know, it's an, these asseverations where you change your mind state, right? There is some good there. It's not really real. It's not really natural. It's like covering up what's really going on. This is one thing about vipassana, why I'm making this distinction between ordinary way of looking and, and insight way of looking is 
through the practice of vipassana it's it's real in a way that any kind of intellectual or or forceful effort to you know, to change things for example it's going to be much different from that that the, 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 it isn't that way isn't the same so vipassana non self according to vipassana is is based on seeing experiences it's about again not just saying there is no self that's not what any of this is about it's not about taking on a view this is impermanent this is suffering this is non self this is not self that's a way of describing what you experience, but it's a change of, of view. It's a realization that trying to change things, approaching things in, in terms of me, mine, is wrong. It's not intellectually wrong, you're saying, well, it's not you, it's not yours. It's just a concept. That's not the point. The point isn't, is it yours, is it not yours? The point isn't, is it you, is it not you? Is it me, is it not me? Is it myself, is it not myself? That's not the point. It's not useful to answer that question. The Buddha never answered the question, is there a self, is there not a self? As far as I know, he didn't. In fact, he was quite clear that he wasn't going to. Not because there is a self. It's just, it's, it's, don't answer that, don't think like that. That's not the point. There's no anything. There's no this. There's no box of Kleenex right here. I'm advertising for them. It's a. Uh, it's it, it's an experience. It's a series of experiences. When you look at reality, when you look at seeing, hearing, smelling, when you when you observe this, look at why I say look at is like vipassana. When you see clearly, experience, see it for what it is. The desire to control, the conception of me and mine, disappears. You see things as not self. You see things as impersonal is maybe the best way of, of describing it. And though it does sound kind of dry and distasteful. It really is. It's impersonal. Meaning there's no concept of the person. And it sounds awful, I suppose. Impersonal. Cold and impersonal, is what we say. But it's wonderful. When you do away with this concern, me and mine, What's wrong with pain? If if the bhikkhuni is in pain, I'm not hurting. I'm not upset. I feel sorry for her, maybe. But I don't suffer. Why do I suffer when I feel pain? Okay, okay, but I'm actually experiencing the pain. But what about if the bhikkhuni's car gets destroyed? Maybe I feel bad for her, probably, hopefully, if I'm a good person. But it's not the same as if my thing, no. But it's really the same with pain. Pain is just another experience. And it may be hard to believe, but the only reason why we suffer from pain is because we cling to it as me, as mine. If we were to see the pain just as pain, the impersonal nature of the experience, because it is nothing related to a person, Hard to grasp, I think. But it's not intellectual. It's meant to be an experience. If you experience it just as pain, what do you mean, me, mine? Really, what does it mean? It means nothing. It's an intellectualization that becomes something meaningful to us and leads us to suffer. Oh no, I'm in pain. We develop knee-jerk reactions to things like pain. I suppose we could conjecture from a karmic, from a long-term point of view. Uh, because pain is associated with broken bones, blood loss, you know, loss of, of 
uh, or, or disturbance in the body which we don't like. You know, that association over lifetime after lifetime has created this aversion and reinforced it. Of course, scientists will tell you that's rubbish. It's just a brain response, but it's unfortunately short-sighted there. No, the, the pain is just pain. It's just an experience. But we do this with much more than pain. How much pain do we feel when our iPhone slips through our fingers and cracks on the floor? How much pain do we feel when our mother, father, sister, brother gets sick, dies? Son, daughter, friend, or when they just change, right? Because of their impermanent, because they're not real. And our concept of them as being, oh, this person is so nice to me. And then they smack you or yell at you or something. Oh. I mean, it's unpleasant in the first place, but it's much worse because we're shocked. How? What happened to them? No, impermanent. It's much worse than just if a stranger did it or if a stranger dies. When I hear about strangers dying, I'm not depressed, but when I hear about my mother, father, sister, brother, son, daughter, good friend dying, it feels bad. Yeah, well, people maybe put aside. It's just so hard to see. We're so in love with people, right? Then people can do such good, such good people. It's hard to let go of them. But so many things we do this with. Our clothes, get a stain on your clothes. If you borrowed it from someone else, maybe you don't feel the same way. You feel afraid because you're worried about the fallout and the consequences. But if it happens to someone else, it's not the same feeling. Right, this is what... And it's awful to say that because shouldn't we feel just as bad when it happens to someone else? Why don't we? Because self. Self-clinging. Insight meditation... Seeing impermanent suffering and non-self, seeing these three things, not intellectually, but changing the way we look at things. In the beginning it's difficult, it's unpleasant even. It's not what we want. Hey, why aren't things no longer stable, satisfying, controllable? But once you get comfortable and familiar with that, how powerful is it? When you're, if your reality is one of understanding things as impermanent suffering and non-self, what could the universe possibly throw at you? All these things I've listed, none of them have any impact on your peace of mind. That's why enlightened people are happy. Anyway, that's the Dhamma for tonight. One hour exactly. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.